um, toxic masculinity and how we catch them young to create positive masculinities. Thank you very much, uh, Lukolo. I really just want to greet all the other panelists and um, apologize my interministerial committee now. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, good morning, South Africa. I think the truth of the matter is catching them young has its own positives and its own negatives. And I think we need to, as South Africa, start to say we have normalized single-headed households. And in our programs at the department, for example, we run the program Men and Boys Championing Change. And uh, we do that through different parliaments, like now we are doing tribal parliaments and it's been a there. And we now are running the boys assemblies. And there's three things that comes out. Um, the first one is that it, it, we need to accept the fact that toxic masculinity starts very young. And if I am a woman raising a boy, sometimes I miss the signs. And we, we, women raising children alone. And as a result, we are raising very angry boys. Not deliberately, but just that there isn't the other part. And in the process of us trying to play both roles of mother and father, um, but also, our, uh, uh, you know, our unsaid anger. Um, boys would say, Deputy Minister, I would, I would say, you know, do you know your father? No, I don't. And I asked my mother, what you give me? I learned to have five. Oh, no, uh, my mother said it's that useless. So sometimes we make this unconsciously. It builds the anger. And this boy that I raise alone is going to be a husband to somebody's daughter. So it is very important that in the process of us discussing masculinity, we also need to say and put it alongside femininity so that we can say, how does the two coexist when one person has to carry it? The second thing is that we run a program called Chomi that talks to Girls and boys 10 to 14 year olds. And amongst the things that we try and establish on the children, it's who do you live with? And truth that is undebated every day is what shows us that the family structure is not functioning. Now we can every day is what shows us that the femininity, whether it's toxic or not, we can talk about patriarchy, we can talk about anything and everything. All of us, we need to hold hands. We can talk about teenage pregnancy, we can drum out the numbers. When all is said and done, Lupolo, for me, working in the social sector, we need to get the family to function. We need to get and rebuild the village. Thank you, my dear. Highlight some of the words you've given us here. Early childhood development, those four as, um, as, as a point of entry for development and the importance of the family structure um, as, as, as the first introduction to the world we live in. This would become a critical part of when we start forming ideas about who we are, how we are, um, what our gender identities are, very much the architecture of the family structure becomes incredibly critical. To all our attendees, now I would like to open the floor to any questions, any comments, um, any points of clarification. We have heard quite a lot today um, about the normalization of violence. We have heard a lot about where attitudes, behaviors, social norms stem 
from in a variety of ways. We have heard about um, some suggestions on how to cultivate positive masculinities. Um, and I'd really like to hone in again on this idea of a multi-stakeholder approach um, to confronting um, the scourge of toxic masculinity and the scourge of gender-based violence. There is no one sector. It has been pointed out that the media role, it has been pointed out that the family structure plays a role, that our religious and our cultural leaders play a role. And um, here I will open up to our attendees by show of hands. Um, please do raise them if you have any questions, any comments for any of the speakers, um, any suggestions you would like to give. I will give a few seconds to the floor. At the moment, I am not seeing, ah, here we go. Um, we have a question here that um, comes from Brian Sokotu from The Citizen. In measuring the depth of toxic masculinity in the country, what are figures telling us? Do we have any figures? I will um, open up to our panelists, starting with the Honorable Deputy Minister. Deputy Minister, do we have any figures? Um, is, it, is it hard to even aggregate something like toxic masculinity? It would be an interesting task for stats essay um, around how we would measure those facts and figures. Um, starting with you, Honorable Deputy Minister, and then opening the floor to our panelists. No, thank you very much. Um, firstly, I think we need to know um, we don't have um, a baseline, but we do have what we call the pointers. For example, uh, social development does collect uh, perpetrator um, numbers, and we utilize that to actually try and profile a perpetrator to be able to implement our prevention programs. That's the first thing that we use to actually try and measure and get a sense. It's engaging with perpetrators and running the perpetrator register. That's the first thing. The second thing that we use in terms of the yardstick, it's the crime statistics, um, issues around uh, you know, the sexual, <clears throat> sexual crimes, but also um, the, the grievous uh, bodily harm. So we utilize that to actually, it gives us, you know, how angry men are. But we also have uh, created uh, in three provinces, safe spaces for men. We also collect data in terms of what are the issues men raise, but we also have a shelter that is dedicated to men. Um, and lastly, what is our markers that guides us? It's also because social development is the custodian of the population policy. So in the population policy, when we do our, um, you know, like household smaller surveys, as, and not as big as compared to those of States SA, but working with States SA, uh, we are able to actually get a sense um, we also have uh, the GBVF command center, and that is fully automated. Um, how many calls uh, came in, whether the call was answered or not, which call was resigned, the files are opened, um, the geolocation uh, uh, strategy shows us. So we, we have a marker as well that actually tells us throughout the country, where do we receive the most calls of women in distress? Um, we have uh, the 0800 150 WhatsApp line. For those that don't actually want to talk, speak up, um, utilize those figures in terms of how many people have actually uh, requested counseling uh, on WhatsApp. Are they perpetrators or are they victims? We use that as a marker to actually give us a sense of the figures. Um, the last one that we use, it's also um, we use the figures that of our admissions to the gender-based violence shelters, um, the women's stories. So we do the sampling and that sampling gives us a sense of the, 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 the extent of the anger that's out there, how the anger is expressed. Uh, lastly, we use uh, our program, Tomi, to engage with 
10 to 14 year olds and they give us a picture of their experiences in the family. Um, you know, my father is always angry. My father is shouting, my mother. We also use that because Chom is amongst the biggest programs that we are running uh, in the country. And it's a face-to-face, -face. it's also visual uh, where we engage children literally every single day. Uh, Childline also gives us the markers as an NPO that we fund a social development. From them, we get the baseline in terms of how many children have actually called crime for help and what was their concerns. But a direct baseline on measuring toxic masculinity, we have never done that. We do it in sampling as I've indicated. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Deputy Minister. Here I will also hand over to you, Commissioner Sidigo, from the side of the Commission of Gender Equality, perhaps um, to give some insights on any kind of indicators you might have on your side that would help us be able to aggregate the extent of toxic masculinity within the country. Thank, thank you so much, uh, our host. The direct answer is that we don't have that, those things. And I, I'm sure it should be something that as, as stakeholders, we must look at it. As it stands like the deputy minister said, we don't, we don't have that. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. We will now move on. Um, Brian, I assume um, you have been answered there. And of the vast architecture we have of ways and indicators, even if the concrete baseline study might not be in place, that is certainly a challenge to us in our multi-stakeholder approach. As academia, as government, as the sector, as development corporations, how we can come together and get a baseline um, study around what that may look like. Nomfundo, I see you have a hand up. Please, over to you. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you very much. Um, we'd like to also talk to the boys' assemblies that the Department of Social, the boys' assemblies that the Department of Social Development uh, is doing and explain exactly what the rhetoric thereof is. Uh, both uh, Dr. Hanafa, uh, but mainly uh, Deputy Minister can talk to that to explain why we are doing what we do. Doc, perhaps I can. Um, Doc, perhaps I can um, hand over to you from the invite from Nomfundo there to give um, some Nomfundo there to give um, some elaboration on some of the programmatic interventions you are embarking on. No, thank you very much, Electrol. Uh, so, um, just to give it a, a context, because. You know, we, we actually, as far back as 2015, we, we called on to the current um, president, uh, invited him to the Constitution Hill, um, you know, and where we were looking at the question of the in, ineffectiveness of our responses. And one of the areas that we had identified uh, was the issue that the commissioner had raised that, you know, working in silos, incoherent, you know, poor coordination and cooperation was having a detrimental impact on our ability to respond as organizations working with men and boys and men and boys from all walks of life. So under the banner of the Takwane Reema, which is event present for Let's Stand Together, we said, how do we create a platform that ensures that we work together in a structured and a coordinated manner? And we looked into the concept of sectoral parliament. So fortunately, parliament did have the foresight as far back as 2004, you know, to start with sectoral parliaments, with women and youth parliament, uh, I think with the inaugural. And so with the concept of men's parliament, this is a, a, a platform uh, that we have looked at. Uh, DM, if you can mute, uh, a platform that we, have, we had looked into in terms of um, ensuring that we, we create the platform that that ensures that it brings men together but leaving no one behind you know um so uh, we go once every two years to the national assembly where we ensure that that we put plans on the table in terms of uh, what is it that needs to be done in meeting the targets responding to the issues that are affecting communities in south africa 
and holding each other accountable in terms of the work that was done um, in the years or the months preceding those sittings so that we hold each other accountable to say who is doing what way and what kind of results are we seeing. Same process is approached uh, in terms of uh, in, in provinces uh, with the legislatures, also in uh, uh, districts where we sit twice a year and also in local. But we've recently launched, I think the DM is not muted. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, I'm, I'm trying to mute. Oh, okay. All right, thanks for that. Um, so in terms of the, the men's parliament, we recently now launched the traditional men's parliament, which is quite exciting for us because you know, the traditional leadership are the custodians on, on norms and values, on culture, their actual mandate uh, as a, uh, from the COCTA as well as, uh, as the National House of Traditional and Coastal Leaders is to ensure that they are custodians of our norms and values as society. So uh, with all the 882 traditional councils, uh, to ensure that we have uh, regular sittings. Fortunately, we do have a history of men sitting uh, historically, the Horo, Ebushan, Tisibaya, you know, uh, um, Mahota. We have been meeting as men historically within our fraternities, you know, as men, ensuring that we engage on issues that affect society. But in those meetings, we want to ensure that through the men's charter, we're meeting to be a progressive society that reinforces positive masculinity, advances gender equality, looks at social um, and norms and, uh, and those kind of values, but also in that when it comes to health seeking behavior, we advance a more, much more progressive role. So when we launched on the 17th of September, the National Transcendence Parliament, and currently we're rolling out the launch of provincial uh, transcendence you know, uh, uh, the issues of personal masculinities, but also importantly partnering with boys because through the boys assemblies and the boys championing change program, we ensure that we work together with the boy child as men of South Africa in ensuring that we exchange, uh, you know, ideas, we influence each other and ultimately ensure that, you know, um, the next generation of, of South African men, we deliver a generation that because currently, as a South African man, I'm the most dangerous person for a woman. Uh, it's just, you know, data that was done in terms of uh, the worst country for female solo travelers in 2019, uh, you know, when the women's danger index was analyzed. South Africa is the unsafest country for a woman traveler in the world, as it stands. So those are some of the proxy measures in the earlier question to say we measure uh, masculinity. You know, we have five times uh, higher the rate of femicide, you know, more than 100 sexual offenses are reported um, each and every day, highest than HIV. We saw the numbers of unintended uh, pregnancies, but more dramatically in terms of, you know, uh, those who are children. So uh, uh, it's, it's those kinds of uh, statistics that indicate that as men of South Africa, as it stands, we're not in a good place, but we want to ensure that we are the last generation through these structures programs of national uh, boys assemblies that we don't deliver uh, the kind of men in the future who we are currently as a society. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. It, uh, you know, it becomes critical conversation that is at the heart of um, your, your, your contribution today, that we carry on speaking about these issues, that we bring together the intergenerational aspect. And there I really want to point out, Doc, that culture, and there I really want to point out, Doc, that um, there is this idea, I think, um, amongst um, custodians of patriarchy that there is a stone somewhere where cultural values have been written down and there it is carved in stone and it cannot move. Culture is not static. Culture adapts. Culture is agile. Um, culture moves with the time. And we, in fact, are the custodians of culture every day. Commissioner, I see you um, um, with your camera on. Um, would you like to add there on some of Doc's programmatic um, efforts that he's seen, some of the insights he's given us on how we can measure the extent of toxic masculinity. Going back to his graph, you know, violence becomes the ultimate symptom of it, but so we can see the root causes around attitudes, beliefs, and norms. Commissioner, um, to yourself. I think from the commissioner's side, the commission side, in terms of, of the programs that we're implementing, we are we are rolling out campaigns which focus on GBV, particularly targeting men and boys. And obviously, we'll, we'll engage uh, Dr. Han.
Um, the commissioner has um, kind of frozen on my side. Doc, I see your video is on. Is he also frozen on your side? Um, uh, sorry, Colo. Thank you very yes, much. Yes, Deputy Minister is ready to respond as well. Please, please. Um, and so um, I will just give Commissioner a chance for, for, for technical glitches, which always occur to rectify themselves. And um, Honorable DM, to you, please, um, to also um, give us your insights and inputs on some of the programmatic efforts um, to, 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 to tackle this social ill. Uh, thank you very much, Lukolo. I think uh, Dr. Hanaka has already outlined, um, firstly, the tribal councils, where we, we as social development, uh, established what we call the Rock Leadership Program. And we are rightfully with you when you say um, culture is, 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 is evolves all the time in recognition of the evolution of culture, but also in the recognition of the fact that um, even rural areas are not the structures the way they used to. Um, the, 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 we, we, we made sure that as social development, we invest resources to actually train traditional leaders on social and structural drivers, not only in, in terms of, but in terms of HIV, in terms of um, GBVF, in terms of drugs, alcohol, Acknowledging the fact that this country does have a structure of tribal uh, uh, councils, and we do have councillors in Duna uh, uh, that are an a valuable asset. But and, and in the rock leadership, I can give you an example of one Hosi who showed us uh, in the northwest uh, Hosi Masibi in Ratu, and he said, "Here, where I govern, there shall be no man that's going to rape a child." There will never be a man that's going to beat up their wife. You beat up your wife, this is what's going to happen to you. Before we call the police, the quota would have dealt with you. And every pregnant child, here where I govern, I want to know who the father is and I'm going, and if the family does not declare, you know, taking us back to the positive elements of culture, to say, if you lived in a rural area like some of us, Nagetwa Pugeng, uh, whether a child is born in Obi Haku Hosi, whether so, so, so we reactivating that just to add to say, let us take what works for culture and let us elevate the whole uh, to, 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 to utilize the tribal courts because they exist, the tribal courts as an intervention so that. Everybody that forms part of that community gets a very clear message that is not confused. And that is why we also have the Tribal Council Men's Parliament. It's to make sure that the Hosi can, like the chief whip would in parliament, crack a whip, set the rules for where they govern and get, you get a dish, a, you, what, and, get you get a uh, dish uh, you wh what your share is uh, in knowing the code of, of um the boys assemblies are very big uh we interacting but i also want to say on this one besides social development interaction and men in general are actually also very active they are beginning to convene boys in their streets in their a district in their local municipality, and that is exciting for social development. Um, we're doing a, 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 a proper a support, believing, as you've kept on saying, multi sectoral response of this, part, this particular aspect. And we're rolling out men's lounges, which are safe spaces for men. And where we have the lounges as we speak, women are able to go and report. I'm identifying, women are able to go and report. I'm identifying Matata Gokhai before Matata Abate, before the problem gets bigger, the men's sector is able to call. And that man, and when a man feels, look, I'm, I've had enough and I'm ready to blow, instead of them going to the Shabin, 
where they're going to get their friends, who's going to give them another, they are able to go to the men's lounge. Um, we've employed male social workers at the request of Dakwaniri Ime as the men's sector, also requested that we would like to talk as men to each other. And we, we are making that uh, 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 able. So there is a number of male social workers that are employed by social development since last year to actually do nothing but focus on programs for men. Look, Lolo, whether we like it or not, women have cried, screamed, marched. There's nothing they did not do. For us to get to zero and for us to get to a, 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 a gender-based violence and femicide-free society, we need the men to get us on the other side. Whether it's drug abuse, whether it's HIV, whether it's the abuse of children, now more than ever, South Africa needs the men. And men who believe they are men, they need to stand up and be counted. Otherwise, we are all gonna paint them with the same brush. Thank you so much, um, Honorable DM, for those words. Um, I'd also just like to highlight um, what you said initially about trainings and capacity development. That is a, a thread we haven't touched on today. As we bring together all these stakeholders, we must understand that they also need capacity.